Okay, so <clears throat> I hope you found that video informative. And um, uh, any, anyways, uh, um, I thought it was interesting. Um, I was pointing out that um, he wasn't, you know, that there's a certain bias towards it. But I think we could also probably sympathize with the bias that the a narrator had. In any case, <clears throat> I wanted you to get some visual uh, uh, um, kind of concept of uh, Ethiopian Christianity in Ethiopia. Um, I also wanted to point out, um, since it comes up from time to time, um, the issue of uh, female circumcision. Um, that um, if you haven't heard of this, um, it's always shocking for the first time. But in many parts of Africa, women um, have uh, various types of um, rituals that remove the entire clitoris. Sometimes there's a piercing. Sometimes they remove much more of the body parts. In some cases, it can be quite an extensive mutilation of the female genitalia. And then other cases, it's a little less so. It's associated with Islam, and it's a controversial aspect uh, in the Islamic world. But it's mainly, if not solely, contained within uh, uh, Africa. And why I'm also bringing this up, <coughs> excuse me, is because it's a practice of the Ethiopian Christians as well, and some other uh, Christian tribes. And so um, it's not something that is strictly Islamic, as many people think. It appears to be a tradition that comes prior to Islam, prior to Christianity. Um, and uh, I believe even the Jews, the Ethiopian Jews, many of them when they went to Israel, initially the women had um, been doing that uh, uh, as well. And the Bible clearly says that a man is supposed to be uh, uh, circumcised for, for a Jewish male. But it isn't mentioned about the women. But that's something that we're doing there. And now medical examinations tend to see that within Israel, Ethiopian Jews um, are no longer practicing that for their females. But um, in any case, I just thought I would bring that up um, uh, because it does come up from time to time. And it's important to notice that it's not a particular religion that practices it within Africa. Um, <clears throat> okay. So moving on from that, um, okay, uh, I'm going to just briefly talk about Bantu Arab culture um, that settles on uh, on East Africa. So again, you noticed a lot of discussion about Arab culture within Africa um, and the blending that takes place. So you have Bantu settlements, right, found from uh, ninth century. Um, in the east, you have Muslim Arabs that come down the coast mainly around the 12th centuries in boats called Thaos. And uh, they end up uh, speaking a language and having a culture that's called Swahili. Many of you have heard this, Kuna Matata, you know that song uh, from Lion King. Well, Swahili is an Arabic word, or it's a derivative of an Arabic word for, for coasters, are those al along the coast. Uh, um, and uh, it's a creation of a, a language, culture, and, and group that was that fusion of Arab and African cultures, which is a very significant one. So you mainly have a lot of Arabic vocabulary with Bantu um, grammar. Uh, um, and uh, uh, my cousin, he was in the Peace Corps, and he was in Tanzania and, and was learning some Swahili. Sometimes uh, I would try to see how much Arabic that I knew, you know, some of the words in, in Arabic that were in Swahili, I think Qalam or, or Qalam, there's a Qal, <laughs> it's, it's a hard a letter to pronounce, um, but uh, uh, for pen, I think they say Galam or, or Qalam, something like that um, for pen. Um, so they have a lot of words. Kuna Matata is pure Swahili and um, I don't, I don't think there's any Arabic in uh, that expression. In any case, um, again, the influence of the Arab world and Arabic on huge parts of Africa is very significant. And due to colonialism, English is also, but that comes, you know, also much later. Um, 
so again here I, I'm showing you some more of a map so you, you see here here's the eastern part um, by the way here's Madagascar and remember the <clears throat> the cartoon movie Madagascar you would never know that there are more people who live in Madagascar than Ireland um, so people from Madagascar have their own thriving culture but if you'd watch uh, the uh, cartoon animation show you would think there was only animals there um, just thought I'd point that out um, okay and let's see here um, Somalia uh, is just in brief I wanted to address <clears throat> um, they border with Ethiopia and um, Somalia has uh, um, also kind of a blend of uh, Arab influence as well um, it has disintegrated quite um, unfortunately um, last several decades they've almost had no nation state and Ethiopia invaded them with US bombing um, several years ago uh, um, so uh, the United States in current times is quite involved in these parts of the world but most of the time you won't see it on the news that much um, just thought to let your way okay um, so I'm going to end the section here again I, I feel like I would like to do a lot more justice um, to uh, um, Africa but uh, um, hopefully there's just little tantalizing aspects that I've been able to offer you I'm gonna play this uh, six minute clip on uh, Bantu peoples and languages again for the same kind of thing and um, and then that'll be it for this section. Even today, the continent of Africa is composed of thousands of different tribal groupings. Each is subtly distinct from the next in custom and language. Such diversity means that most Africans have to master more than one language, and they acquire those skills at a very young age. I would like to find out how many languages you speak. Who here speaks, knows how to speak Bemba? Uh -huh. Does anybody else know how to understand or speak Lozi? You speak Lozi? Yes. Do you also speak Emba? Yes. Is there another language that you speak also? Lovac. Lovac. That's four languages. That's good. Most Americans speak only one language. exposure to these different languages, you begin to realize one thing. They all sound remarkably similar. I'm fascinated with languages, and wherever I've been going, I'm asking Africans, what's your language, and tell me some words in your language. So here's what I found out for the word for sun. In the Nyanja language, sun is a Zuba. In the Bemba language, it's Aka Zuba. In Chiwa, it's Duzuba. And in the Sengu language, it's Zuba again. Or the word for water in the Nyanja language, it's Manzi. And in Bemba, it's Amenshi. And in Chiwa, it's Manzi, similar to each other again. What do these linguistic similarities tell us? That there is a common root for most of the modern languages of tropical Africa. A single ancestral language spoken by a single group of people from which the many languages of today have descended. Linguistic analysis has isolated a family of languages known as Bantu, which originated in tropical West Africa. About 5,000 years ago, the early Bantu speakers began to spread into new lands, bringing their crops, their animals, and their language with them. And over centuries, Bantu culture evolved, diversifying into hundreds of tribes, expanding across the tropical region of Africa.
But the truth of this pan-African civilization was suppressed for many years. Dr. Alex Skirman is trying to overturn the legacy of South Africa's racist past. She has been excavating an archaeological site on the banks of the Limpopo River. In the early part of the 20th century, um, there were rumors in the white South African community about this place, in their minds linked to the Queen of Sheba or some other early white civilization in southern Africa, trying to show that the Phoenicians or the Sabaeans, basically anybody who's a bit lighter skinned than Africans, were here first and that they found the opposite, that Africans actually had an amazing great history and that they had earlier states um, running before, way before um, any white set foot in Africa. This site, known as Mapungubwe, the place of the jackal, formed the heart of a kingdom similar to the earliest civilizations in Europe. surplus to feed the city or town. They had cattle, they had sheep, they grew sorghum, millet, they worked iron. It was a massive, amazing development that occurred in Southern Africa. And this was not an isolated state. It formed part of a much larger economic network that had spread across Southern Africa and beyond. These are Mapungubwe beads. They're gorgeous blue ones. These are glass beads that came down the Indian Ocean coast. Um, and through them, we know that Mapungubwe is part of the international trade network, um, linking it all the way to the coast. It's an incredible African accomplishment to set up such a complex trade network that links all the way into northern Botswana, bring material from there and taking it all the way to the Indian Ocean coast. And there you have it. 